it arrived with the army of England's new king. It was the summer of 1485. Just days earlier, tens of thousands of men had been fighting for their lives on the marshy field in Bosworth. The jury was out up until that day. Who would win? The bitter rivalry between Henry Tudor and Richard III was finally resolved with Richard III lying dead in that battlefield. Now, Henry VII, as he would be crowned, the victor of that battle, led his troops on to London. Little did he know, though, what he was bringing with him. And they would face a very different type of mortal peril, not one which would be fought or seen by sword, but that which would be not seen, but nevertheless still physically felt. The first sign was a feeling of general apprehension, which soon led physically to shivers and pains and headaches. Then the perspiration in the body would set in. The victims would be swamped by a torrent of sweat, which would lead to an insatiable thirst and the onset of delirium. Finally, they would have an overwhelming urge to sleep, of which if they gave in to that urge to sleep, they would often not awake, but would die. The fatality rate was 50%. The army had brought back with them a strange and unknown disease that would be known as the English sweat. This alarming sickness swept across the city, killing 15,000 people in just six weeks. Eventually, the epidemic fizzled out, but not before it had spread to Europe, leaving plenty of mourners in its wake. And then it came back again and again. The disease's reign of terror continued throughout the next generation of Tudors, striking four more times over the coming century. Henry VII's son, Henry VIII, was petrified. During one particularly devastating outbreak of the English sweat, he slept in a different bed every night, presuming to outmaneuver it. Here was a disease that could strike out of nowhere, often leading to death in a matter of hours. One historian would write that you could be merry at dinner and be dead at supper. To this day, no one has any clear idea what caused the mysterious English sweat. But the leading theory is that this mega outbreak wasn't caused by the flu or Ebola or any of the infamous diseases that we often hear about today. Instead, the culprit was a type of hantivirus, a rare family of viruses that typically infect rodents, and it spread to humans. All this talk of viruses reminds me that there's often a virus that spreads before our watching eye in many of churches today, taking with it many of spiritual lives. But unlike the virus of the 1400s where they do not know where it came from or what caused it, we know where this virus comes from and we know what causes it. But instead of dealing with it and those affected by it, we often purposely choose not to do so under this modern version, a distorted view of love. The title today of our message is Church Discipline. A church that listens to Jesus and cares for each other. This is part two in a message, a two-part message about church discipline. Next week, we'll be starting the book of Hosea together and for the following weeks. But from three weeks ago, we had our first installment in this. And if you have not been with us in these previous weeks, we have taken a break due to events in the life of our church these previous Sundays, but we return today to where we left off three weeks ago. If you've not heard that, I would encourage you to go back to our webpage, go back to our YouTube channel, and to find that message where you can be brought up to speed. But for the sake of brief review, let me say a few things that we might all be brought together. 
When talking about the conversation of church discipline, which admittedly in the ears of perhaps many of you, at least many in the world today, sounds strange, if not greatly misunderstood, it's important that we establish a few foundations, and that's some of which we covered last time. The important foundations would be answering questions like, what is the gospel? What is a Christian? What is a church? And how do these relate to each other? If at any point you do not understand those questions, it's eventually the inevitable conclusion you will not understand church discipline. Furthermore, when we talked about church discipline three weeks ago, we talked about its purposes. Three purposes to church discipline. Number one, to care for the Christian by restoring them. To address out of sincere care as biblically defined for them of what is present in an ongoing, unrepentant fashion. Secondly, to keep the sin from spreading to others, to becoming the virus that takes over others, as Paul, as we'll see this morning, would say in 1 Corinthians 5. And then third, to give a consistent witness to the watching world. That we want people to think rightly about Jesus. Rightly not in that he perfects people, well, he does by their declaration of righteousness, but by their practice, it's a progression. And it's by no means an ongoing perfect progression, but nevertheless a progression by which we are now being made aware of that which dishonors our Savior, and we knowingly, either by our own understanding of the Word of God, led by the Holy Spirit in our conscience, or by others who bring it to our attention, deal with that, mature in how we respond to that. In summary fashion, you could say last time we learned that a church that doesn't provide care for its people and at times correction is a church that doesn't truly love its people nor demonstrate obedience to Christ. All that by way of review. But for our purposes this morning, we want to continue this study to look at it together. By first, we're going to learn discipline is a form of love. And to see that, go to Hebrews chapter 12. It's our practice to be studying the Bible together each and every Sunday at Grace Church. If you have a Bible, turn there if you could with me. Hebrews chapter 12 as we see this text. If you don't have a Bible, the Bible's new to you, you are welcome just to listen in. Some of the texts of which I'll be reading this morning, not this one, but other ones, will be put on the screen for you to follow along. But know that we have free Bibles at the Welcome Center if you don't have one that you can take home, that there's one provided for you. You might even find one for our purposes this morning on the back of the pew in front of you. Our first lesson is that discipline is a form of love. Now, the author of Hebrews, we're jumping into the text here in chapter 12. Author of Hebrews is talking about how Jesus is the founder and perfecter of our faith. And if you would, just follow along with me. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3 through verse 11. The author of Hebrews writes, Consider him, this being Jesus, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, We have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness, to those who have been trained by it. We'll stop there. What I want you to see in this text as so clearly taught here is that discipline is not different from love. In fact, as we see in the text, discipline is a display of love. It's a demonstration of care. What that actually looks like as someone is being provided for and loved accordingly. 
We can see in verses five to six, when Christians experience trials and sufferings from God, it is because God is using them to teach and to discipline Christians by such experiences. You'll go back to verse four as it talks about this struggle against sin. How God uses this struggle and how he disciplines us accordingly that he might produce in us something for our good. As it says in verse 10, he disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. Verses 7 through 10 talks about how our fathers were supposed to discipline us. Now admittedly, this analogy is for a lot of you where this starts to derail. For some of you it derails because either A, you were never disciplined as a child. So you have no reference to this. The presupposition, the text is a loving father cares for his child accordingly. And for some of you, that's missed as a point of reference. Others of you, tragically, were not disciplined. You were abused. And so to think of a father disciplining, you only put that term as a cast of abuse and therefore wrongly associate that with a heavenly father who somehow would abuse you. Friends, both of which are inaccurate. One is lacking because there's no example to reference, and one is distorted because it's a perverted example. But the scripture expects and explains a normal loving relationship of a parent to a child. That like a loving parent disciplines a child, not giving the child everything the child wants, and at times correcting the child, at times even necessarily in a punitive way, as a way to show care for them, so does God for his children. This is a display of love. You notice as well in verse 11, this long-term perspective versus short-term. For the moment, all discipline seems painful. That moment, that initial experience, rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You ever watch children play sports? learning a new game, a new sport, if you will, soccer, football. Let's take the sport of soccer. There's so much training to do for a young boy or a young girl as they're learning how to play the game. There's so much instruction, you know, the ball and, okay, who's kicking it to who and where do I go with this thing and do I have to play the whole game or can I stop and stare up at the sky and when is the snack break and ice is hot, I don't want to play anymore, and you could just see the whole experience. And it's pretty funny when you watch young children play soccer, for example, because it's like this like horde of like bees, and just kind of go all around together. I have like zero clue about like spacing out and playing spaces and, you know, forwards and defense are like, oh, ball, that's me, that's me, oh, goal, that's me. And inevitably, they just get confused and disoriented, and like coaches are on the side of the field like, half like losing their mind and half so proud of them. And a referee, when they're young, are quite wondering like, man, what do we even call here? What do I even say? I mean, what, I mean, how do I even call a foul? But imagine teaching children to play a sport like soccer, and at no point does the referee ever grab the whistle and blow and stop to play. At no point does the coach ever pull the kids in for say, okay, listen, just to be clear, that's actually not our goal. That's our goal. You actually keep shooting in the wrong goal. And you keep giving them points. Could you stop doing that, Jose? Please. Instead, imagine a coach just says, I'm just so proud of you. You are so adorable. You look so cute in your outfit. Wait till you get the treat afterwards. And everybody, no matter what the score is, and no matter how they played, everybody gets a trophy. You would go, okay, that might be okay when they're like four, but like imagine a soccer team in college. Yeah, you can't imagine it because those soccer teams don't exist. There's no such thing as competition. But that way of thinking about sports seems ludicrous to our sensibilities, appropriately so. But imagine a church with a bunch of Christians who are some new to the faith. They don't know much. They honestly have not even read much. 
and what they have read, they're not quite sure they understand, but they have enough to know as they've heard the gospel, they've responded to faith in Christ and that sin is what Christ died for and I've been forgiven of that and therefore I don't wanna go back to that and so I should live accordingly. But imagine then seeing a church full of Christians doing whatever they please, going all kinds of directions and just saying to them all the time, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. I love you. Here's a participation trophy for, I don't know, just like breathing air. What kind of church is that? But that's a vision that a lot of people would actually expect and want of churches. But that's nothing like what the Bible actually describes. The problem for many Christians in general, and to be honest, pastors like myself in particular, is that good desires can produce bad temptations. It's a good desire to be loving. It's a good desire to be patient. It's a good desire to be gracious. The Bible supports such things. But if you're not careful, those things will produce bad temptations by which will become distorted to recast the vision of the Christian life and community together. We should be aware of falling into this trap of thinking that we are wiser than God or more loving than God. And yet this is what we're saying when we think we know better and we do something other than what God's word says. Which takes us to our second lesson. Discipline is a prayerful, patient process. Discipline is a prayerful, patient process. Let's return to a text that we looked at three weeks ago. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18 is a text that as a church family we've been familiar with. It was back in July and August of 2021. We were preaching through the entire book of Matthew, but particularly in the end of July and the beginning of August of 2021 that we spent two weeks just in this text I'm about to read, and I would encourage you to go back and listen to that. If you have missed that or forgotten that, that'll explain in more detail what I will simply say in fashion, summary fashion this morning. But let me just read to you the text, Matthew 18. Jesus is talking here. Chapter 18, verse 1, he talks about the disciples coming to Jesus, wanting to know who's the greatest in the kingdom. Jesus explains that. And then he says in verse 7, Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptation comes, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. He talks about how seriously to take sin. Verses 8 and 9, he uses radical language about causing whatever's causing you to sin to cut it off, throw it away, pluck it out. Then in verse 10, He talks about despising one of these little ones. Do not despising them. He's talking about a faithful shepherd like God is a faithful shepherd, pursuing the wandering sheep, not just the 99 who are in the flock, but the one who wanders. This is the will of my Father who is in heaven, verse 14, that one of these should not perish. That's the context in our text in verse 15 through 20. Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone, if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. And then Jesus goes on to verse 21 and following to teach about forgiveness. So in the context, we see this text. And this text is important to understand. And if I may, in summary fashion, explain to you what Jesus is saying there in verses 15. There is a a process, if you will. We could really describe as sort of four steps. 
The first step is the awareness of perhaps even the offense committed against you, other times not, as we learn in other scripture, of, a, of the sin of a professing brother or sister in Christ. And you notice that's what's being said here in verse 15, if your brother. Jesus is teaching about the relationship that Christians have to other Christians. It is interesting to sometimes realize and it's sweetly important to remind ourselves that Christians often have a closer relationship to one another than sometimes they even do to their own earthly family. Why? Well, it's because of their shared commitment to and devotion to Jesus Christ, the resurrected Savior. Their faith in him alone. That does not in any way despise or in any way diminish their family that they have, that they may be married to or they're related to. But there is a reality that's true in the body of Christ. We are family. If God is our father, then we are each other's brothers and sisters. And there is an expectation of responsibility that should be seen here. Jesus is saying in verse 15, it all begins with a private conversation. A private conversation that really is in some sense a confrontation. The reality is that this happens regularly in the life of a church in all kinds of contexts. The member who knows of an unrepentant sin is to go to the one of another who has sinned and in love and in humility examining themselves first without a spirit of judgmentalism but by them being the standard but by God's word being the standard to bring it to their attention. Hey, are you aware? Have you given any thought of what you have said? Are you aware of what you have done in light of what scripture says? Maybe I don't understand the full story, but it looks, from what I'm understanding, what you're doing is sinful. And by no means am I saying, am I sinless, and I would want to have the same conversation you with me as I'm trying to have with you if you see something like this in my life. But my concern is what I'm seeing is not just an isolated incident. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9 says, love covers a multitude of sins. Rather, what I'm seeing here, friend, is a repeated, perpetual ongoing, unrepentant sin. And you're perhaps not aware of it, or perhaps sometimes in the fallacy of privacy, you're hoping others aren't aware of it. And I'm just here to say as your friend, as you're, in the words of Jesus, your brother or your sister, I'm aware, God's aware. How can I help you? I can identify that temptation. I can see the challenge that you're facing. How can I help you? What's brought you to this point? How can I walk with you to let you come back to the pastures of what you've otherwise wandered from? Do you see the tone there? Humble, patient, biblical, gentle, having that private conversation. This should be happening regularly in the relationship of Christian community. Friends, if you're in a church that doesn't have these kind of conversations, then you either are misunderstanding what it's like to have a relationship in a church, or you just might need to be in a different church. Seeing the sin of others is not an opportunity to have a conversation about others. That's called gossip. It's to have an opportunity to have a conversation with others. That's care. Notice what Jesus does here in the text. You go have the conversation with them. Not about them with others. That itself is sin. That's gossip. That could lead towards slander. Instead, Jesus is saying, have the conversation with them. It's a private conversation. This type of interaction should be happening all the time. Jesus commands his people to speak privately first, just between the two of them. And if in God's grace, this usually is the means by which he works repentance in the hearts of his people. And oh, how it is a sweet thing to see the body grow. In maturity and love. As the proverb says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. It speaks such words of life and hope, correction and care. But then look at what Jesus says next. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But verse 16, if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. This next step, if necessary, involves others, but not many. Jesus instructs the members to take one or two others along to confirm and to confront. 
that we're not just having some personality disagreement here. We're not just like, well, we just disagree on a wisdom issue. That on that matters, our freedom in Christ, that we probably would do something different. But this is an undeniably biblically supported legitimate concern. And other objective parties are involved, perhaps objective but yet relational, those who perhaps might know the individual. It's worth considering where they might come together as a member of that church and gathering together, a trusted friend perhaps speaking into their life. Again, this is in a private context. Sometimes it happens in a phone call, ideally in person. Body language is seen, eye contact is made, tone of voice is understood. This is loving care. I just want you to understand for those of you who are dating, and I use that term kind of relationally, about Grace Church, this is a good chance as you are in a dating relationship to get to know what a person is like. This is what we want to be about as a church. This is what Grace Church is about. Private conversations and concerns, pursuit and love for each other. I'm reminded often what's often tragically true and when sometimes these conversations take place, it's like when someone's holding something really strongly in their hand. You've seen people do that, right? There are things that you hold so tight in your hand, it's so hard to, get, to let go. And honestly, depending on what you're holding, you could explain whether that's a good or a bad thing. You're holding a snake in your hand, let go, friend, as quickly as you can. That thing will bite you and hurt you. But if you've reached out to a child who's struggling and stumbling off of a cliff and you've grabbed them at the last minute and holding onto their wrist, with all of your life, hold on. Do not let go. What often happens when you're having a conversation with a Christian about sin in their life, if they're so married to it, is that they've got their hands so tightly wrapped around it, they do not want to let go. And they lose their bearings. Prior to that moment, they have seemingly forgotten about all the relationship that has been had, all of the pastoral care that's been demonstrated, all the prayers that have been prayed, all the studies that have been had together, all of the sermons that have been listened to and the songs that have been sung and the love and the service and the laughter and the tears and the rejoicing. In that moment, all of that is forgotten. The only thing that is loved and wanted more than anything else is that sin. And friends come alongside with gentleness and care and humility and try to lovingly pry open their hand with the scriptures and say, friend, let go of that. Let go of that. Give that to the Lord. But ironically, what that person is so tightly clinging close to that sin wants is they want you to let go, not them. They want you to let go of the Bible. Open your hand and let those verses fall out. You're in Matthew 18, turn to Matthew 19. They want you to let that pass and let them hold closely and tightly to their sin. They're creating a different distorted view of love saying, love me the way I want to be loved, not the way God says to love me. And this is why these people are involved in this conversation. And it says there in Matthew 18, verse 17, Jesus says, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Usually somewhere around step two, maybe before or after, a Christian is involving the elders of the church, the leaders. This might begin with the conversation. Eventually the elders are often involved because they do have a responsibility for the sheep. That's clear from the scriptures. They do have to give an account to God. Hebrews 13 would say this, for such individuals. And this is why I would say, as a side note, you really want to make sure you're part of a church that has godly, qualified elders who are men of conviction and of courage. Conviction that they have a clear understanding of what the word of God says and courage, a clear commitment to make sure that the church will follow the word of God no matter the criticisms that come from others. And here what you see in step three is Jesus saying, telling it to the church. The responsibility is that people might know so that they can pray 
You just turn up the dial of care. And for those who know, pursue that it can be like a care in 3D surround sound of love. Wayne Mack writes in his book, Life in the Father's House, the following. Most people, including many Christians, shudder when they read about confrontation that may even involve a public rebuke of a sinning brother. The reason they find this repulsive is that it seems to them to be a very unloving thing to do. But on the contrary, the scripture teaches that confrontation is actually one of the fullest ways we can express our love for others. Ignoring broken relationships or other sin in the body is usually the easier road for us. But it would be harmful to those involved and therefore selfish. If we genuinely care for others, he writes, however, we will be willing to sacrifice our own time, energy, and comfort in order to help them have a right relationship to Christ and others. Looking back on our text in Matthew 18, Jesus says in the middle of verse 17, if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. This term Gentile is a term to basically refer to somebody who's outside of the covenant community of God's people. Tax collector is a type of analogy, a word picture for them and their Jewish sensibilities of somebody that had betrayed God's people in the witness and allegiance to God himself. And Jesus says this person should be treated accordingly. The question that obviously should be understood is, well, what gives a church a prerogative to do that? Well, I think Jesus knows that accusation is coming, so look at what he says in verse 18. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Verse 20. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Contrary to perhaps what a lot of you have been told, verse 20 is not a prayer verse. You know, where you've been told, like, hey, two or three are here, we're gathered, Jesus is now here with us, as if to say, when you're having your own quiet time, sorry, you know what, God's not there. Mm, that's kind of a bummer for you. You need to get another Christian, then God's there. That's not what the text is about. The text is about the prerogative that God gives his people to communicate on his behalf, based on his word, for his good and his people's lives, for their good and his glory. Following all these previous steps, the individual continues to refuse to listen even to the church. Then they should be distanced from that. That doesn't mean that they're put out in the sense that they cannot attend as if they can't hear the gospel. That is the hope of Jesus Christ. This is a process that's done by prayer with great patience, with solid biblical conviction, out of love for the person, out of love for the people at large in the body of Christ and for the witness of Christ in the community. Think of it like this. There's only one reason why a person is disciplined. You're like, really? Because I can think of a lot of reasons. Like adultery, bank robbery, slander, forsaking the fellowship of the saints, i.e. refusing to come to church. I can think of a lot of reasons. True. But at the end of the day, in a different sort of way, think of it like this. There's only really one reason. Why? Unrepentance. The problem is not do Christians sin. Christians sin. It's embarrassingly true. To those of you who are non-Christians, I wanted to say this on our behalf publicly right now. The problem is when we're made aware of it by conscience, conviction, or others in our conversation, and we refuse to turn from it. Therein lies the big problem. Which takes us to our third and final lesson. Discipline demonstrates care for the gospel. Discipline is a form of love. Discipline is a prayerful, patient process. And third and final, discipline demonstrates care for the gospel. Our final big text to look at to see a case study, do me a favor and go to 1 Corinthians. You might be new to the Bible. You're like, where is 1 Corinthians? Well, go to the right of Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, writing to a young church in the city of Corinth, like Grace Church is a young church. We're only three years old in the city of Miami. 
And he's writing to them about a number of issues. He's super thankful for them. They're growing, they're maturing, but they got a lot of issues. He gives thanks to God for them, chapter 1, verse 4 and following. But they got issues of divide, divide, divisions in the church, issues of drunkenness at the Lord's Supper, because they're like coming together early, drinking all the wine, issues of the spiritual gift talent show and trying to make it all about themselves. One issue that they've got is the fact that they've got an undeniable problem in the church that everybody's aware of. It's made its way to the whole church, but no one's dealing with it. And if you would, follow with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verses 1 to 13. Listen to what Paul says. It's actually reported, it's known, that there's a sexual immorality among you and of a kind that's not even tolerated among pagans. I mean, non Christians know better. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Are you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? In other words, the sin of one will affect the whole body. Verse 7, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us, therefore, celebrate the festival. Not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or of the greedy and swindlers or idolaters since then you would need to go out of the world. But I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, a swindler, and not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. So let me explain to you what Paul's talking about. In this church, you basically have a man who's having a sexual relationship with his, apparently his stepmother. And it is known to everybody. You could say, in a sense, it's been an assumed step one, step two, step three, and they're not dealing with it. And Paul's like, listen, I'm not surprised when people who are not Christians sin. That's what they do. That's what you used to do all the time. Like, you loved it. I'm surprised when Christians knowingly sin, don't repent of it, and furthermore, other Christians are aware of it and don't deal with it. He goes, that's your responsibility as a church. To fail to care for each other is to fail to care for the witness of Christ in your community. Can you imagine the reputation of a church that would do this today? Well, God can. Because he speaks of it all the time in his word. I mean, just listen to Galatians chapter 1. Don't turn there, just listen. We have it for you on the screen. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. Paul says to a different church, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Look at Titus chapter 3, verse 8 through 11 on the screen. Paul says to one of his disciples, Titus, who's helping new churches 
on the island of Crete, off the island of the country of Greece, he says this in verse 8. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division... After warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. Friends, here's the summary. Whether you're dealing with the rank and morality that's referenced in 1 Corinthians 5, whether you're dealing with the false teaching that's referenced in Galatians 1 of a different gospel, or whether you're dealing with the divisiveness that comes within a church and divides the church as we see in Titus 3, Paul is not saying, well, who are you to judge? Paul's not saying, let go and let God. God's word is saying, humbly, biblically, do something about it. Because if you don't, you're compromising the integrity of the gospel witness. For those of you who are not Christians, let me be very clear what I do not want you to misunderstand today. It is true what perhaps you've been told by other Christian friends who maybe even brought you here today. It is true. God loves you right where you are. But it's not true that God intends to leave you where you are. See, the good news of Jesus is only better and greater, greatly understood against the bad news of what we've already sung and read about this morning. In our natural state, you mean everybody else in the world. Though we are made in the image of God, we rebel against God. We seek our own desires. And that will have an eternal consequence of judgment in hell. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, loved us and sent his son for us that all who would ever believe in him for the forgiveness of sins, that in his perfect life, in his sacrificial death, in his powerful resurrection from the grave, that all those who see, they have no hope with God on their own, but only in God's son, they are forgiven. That's what you need to understand this morning. As you listen in on a family conversation of those who have professed to believe that, but sometimes can struggle themselves with themselves or with each other what to do after that. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, God saved us that we would walk in the good works he prepared for us. So friends, Christians and non-Christians alike, God's grace is seen in the gift of salvation in his son and in the gift of sanctification in his Holy Spirit maturing us and growing us. We need to be sure to have a faithful witness as a church. When discipline is divorced from the gospel, it eventually creates a distorted view of the Christian life. It becomes judgmental and simply ethical. It's about refereeing versus leading people to realize the significance of gospel clarity in profession and corresponding practice. If you don't understand what the gospel is, if you don't know what a Christian is, if you're not sure what a church is, then you will likely not understand what church discipline is. But if you understand those things in the context of Scripture, then you'll see this. Church discipline is about a reputation. But not yours or mine or ours. Ultimately, the reputation of Jesus Christ. And we want to be faithful to his word and to live accordingly as a people committed to that promise.